Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great uh, privilege uh, for me on behalf of the World Economic Forum and our partner, uh, CII, and also know the government of India, uh, to welcome the external, uh, external Affairs Minister, S. Uh, Jai uh, Shankar, uh, here uh, to our uh, meeting. Uh, thank you for coming, and we know that uh, you just arrived uh, this morning uh, from uh, an important visit uh, to the U.S. We also know that uh, Prime Minister Modi had um, a very successful uh, visit to the U.S. Um, last week. Um, also had 50,000 expats, Indian expats, meeting him and uh, President uh, Trump uh, in Houston. Maybe, Minister, you were there uh, mm -hmm. too. Uh, I think it was uh, greeted howdy modi um, by by the crowds. Uh, is there no uh, under Prime Minister Modi and your uh, leadership? A sp would you say it's a special uh, relationship between the U.S. and India, and is this something new? Because in the 70s, it used to be with Russia. 70s was a long time you know, <laughs> ago. Uh, though, though, mind you, I, I started to work in the 70s, so I can still hazily remember it. But uh, look, I'm, I'm not sure what adjective I would put on it, uh, but definitely, I mean, if uh, the, the kind of event you saw in Texas, the Howdy Modi event, it's not um, too many countries you can do that. No. Uh, so certainly that, that is something unique. But the fact is, uh, if you look at our, at our relationship with the U.S., how much it's changed, the extent of convergences that we have uh, with the U.S., shared interest in many areas, the size of the economic relationship, uh, the trade, the investment, the, the knowledge relationship with the U.S., uh, the fact that uh, that has given rise to actually industries uh, in the Indian economy. Uh, the community, uh, you know, we are, we are today uh, depending, I mean, I think the American citizens, the Indian Americans uh, would be about three and a half million, maybe two, two million plus more of uh, Indians living out there. So you put it all together and, and so many students. You know. And very successful yeah. Indians yeah, too, yes, many indeed. CEOs yeah. in yes, the yes. big companies. Uh, absolutely. So if you put it all together, I would say in many ways it's a pretty unique relationship. And, and I think that was reflected partly in what was visible at Houston. Yesterday we uh, had uh, Secretary uh, Wilbur Ross of mm -hmm. Commerce mm -hmm. here and also in a discussion with uh, your commerce uh, minister. Mm -hmm. um, and there is no a lot of uh, suspense and uh, there is a lot of interest. Is there going to be a trade deal between uh, the largest economy in the world, being the US, and uh, the fastest growing of the emerging uh, economies of, of, of size, like in the RU? What, what was the zeitgeist you felt when you were in the White House uh, yesterday and met with the new national security advisor and other uh, Trump uh, advisor? Is it going to happen? Well, uh, you know, if you had our Commerce Minister and Mr. Ross here, I'll go with any answer they gave you. <laughs> uh, so, because ultimately they have to work it out. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the only thing which I can tell I think Lighthizer is involved too a bit. Yeah, though, sure, 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 <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, but the, the, what, what I can tell you as a foreign minister is I understand, you know, as an as a interested uh, spectator, uh, <laughs> that this is a, you know, it's, it's not that easy. You know, I mean, there's, it's, it's a fairly complicated set of issues because you are really looking at uh, you know, trying to clear up issues for which there aren't, there isn't mirror imaging in many ways. Uh, so, so I guess if they are taking a little time, they would be justified in doing so. From what I read in the newspapers today, both of them sounded kind of cautiously optimistic. Would that be right? No, I, I think that is uh, the feeling I got also. Yeah, sure. From we had a closed meeting yesterday between the two of them that I moderated. Right. But you know. Also, um, 
having been trade minister in my uh, yeah. country so, uh, before I have negotiated it with India and U.S. separately, and uh, okay. you have I my sympathies. I, uh, okay. I, I, I would say, no, I would say that it, it would be very interesting to be a fly on the wall during those negotiations Absolutely. because they're some of the best prepared trade negotiators in the world, both mm -hmm. of you, huh? Mm -hmm. Which, which is why you had my sympathies. Yes. <laughs> but but uh, no, but yeah. look seriously, uh, I I do know a lot of work has gone into it. I know teams have been meeting, uh, and clearly Mr. Goyal uh, has the lead on our, uh, our side, and uh, uh, Ambassador Lighthizer has on the American side. Uh, and the the you know uh, my my sort of last check on it was just before. Uh, Prime Minister met President Trump, and I think a lot of people heard uh, them uh, speak about it to the press. So, uh, uh, whatever was the was the mood, you know, the temperature check that you did yesterday. I guess that would really be the latest. But I, I think also, uh, with all due respect, we know uh, uh, Foreign Ministry is also very influential uh, in this context, and. Uh, trade negotiators can continue for decades just arguing about uh, uh, one agriculture uh, product. But it seems that um, you know, if there is a political will and if there is a will uh, from the top and say, let's now try to agree on something, uh, it can uh, happen. And it seems like now it is a special moment also in the relationship between those two uh, countries and maybe the situation uh, with China has also uh, created more momentum for this deal uh, and Japan is 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 that correct well uh, look uh, uh, I mean you may have a point but in our case yeah, what I can say is that uh, certainly in this government uh, the concern ministers which is really trade uh, finance foreign I mean and some of the line ministries because their uh, sectoral ministries because their interests are involved. Uh, people really work together very, very closely as a team. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I know that is a caricature of a trade negotiator that they can go on endlessly on very siloed issues. Uh, but you would have seen yesterday, our commerce minister is a very strategic person. Uh, so, so he's completely capable of managing this, trust me. Talking about uh, being strategic, uh, we have seen that uh, you and your uh, government has also uh, made a priority of uh, South Asia. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of uh, uh, participants there and guests uh, from uh, Nepal, uh, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, also Sri Lanka, uh, Maldives. Uh, we also saw that you, you know, stepped up the money that you allocated for uh, partnerships with many of these uh, countries. Will we see an enlarged Indian footprint uh, in South uh, Asia? And is also this uh, due to the fact that uh, many of these countries, it's like India meeting China? Uh, you know, I know, I, I don't think it's so much India meeting China. Uh, I would put it quite differently. Uh, you know, when you travel around in the world, and uh, you, you wouldn't disagree with me, uh, South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, is really uh, among the least regionalized uh, economies uh, that, that you see. There are various reasons for it. Uh, now, uh, from, you know, from the very start, uh, Prime Minister feels very strongly that we need to do something about this. Uh, and uh, we have to convince our neighbors that really the Indian economy is a lifting tide for all of them. Uh, and to, because we are the largest uh, economy and the largest country, a lot of that responsibility is on us. Uh, and uh, you could see that even politically in his first steps when he was sworn in in 2014, uh, he invited all the uh, regional, the neighboring countries for his swearing in. That was a political signal. Uh, but after that, uh, in those five years, the first term, uh, we've really given, a, made a great effort really to do the things which other regions have done. Uh, you know, build connectivity, increase contacts, have a greater flow of people, encourage more business between them. 
so, uh, and, and we've done that really uh, without real setting aside the old sort of the more orthodox diplomacy, you know, we don't talk reciprocity uh, in our neighborhood uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, you can see that reflected in the numbers. I mean, today we have very ambitious uh, lines of credit, soft loans to all our neighbors. Uh, there are a lot of projects which are done under grant. Uh, the, training, uh, the training numbers have gone up many times. Uh, we've gone into new areas and, and it's really hard. Uh, uh, it's already actually you can see the impact both on their economies, on our economies and the connection in between. And uh, if I were to give you very common sense examples, I mean, you would have situations where, uh, let us say, it's easier to go to a port of a neighbor uh, than it is to your own port, but in the old days, you wouldn't do it, you know. Uh, or you would have excess electricity in one part of India, demand in a neighboring country, but there's no way by which uh, you could do the transmission. So today, if you look you know, what we are actually trying to do on the ground, uh, power transmission, fuel sub, you know, supply, uh, building border roads, uh, sometimes fairly uh, uh, deep inside the other country, uh, port, uh, connectivity to ports, uh, uh, sort of uh, creating effective waterways. So there, there's an enormous push, railways, uh, and this is the case I would say probably the most advanced would be Bangladesh. Uh, we are now making very good headway in Nepal. Uh, so there are road projects, rail projects underway out there. We've started about two, three years ago, power supply to Myanmar. It's still in the early stages. Uh, we've done a lot of railway uh, lines in Sri Lanka. Uh, Bhutan has uh, historically actually been our best partner in terms of development assistance. So, so pretty much, I would say, uh, the, the entire neighborhood uh, minus one uh, has been actually a fairly good story uh, of uh, uh, regional cooperation. And I think you will see that uh, continue to probably see that scaled up. It's reflected in our foreign ministry budgets. Uh, and I, I kind of see that going uh, higher. Thank you for mentioning this uh, minus one, because that gave me uh, a chance to also address maybe uh, what some people in the room would say is, is like uh, the elephant uh, in the room. I guess, uh, did you have any meetings when you were uh, in the US where the Kashmir issue didn't come up? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, I did have uh, some, uh, in fact, quite a few. Uh, there, were, there were some where it did come up and it didn't come up in my business meetings. It didn't come up even in some of the policy meetings because I think uh, people, uh, New opposition, and uh, uh, but it did come up on quite a few occasions. So, uh, but you know, but that's natural mm -hmm. because uh, for many people, there's some, there's a change of status quo. There's a change, uh, and when there's a change, naturally, there's interest. And um, there is um, looking uh, looking forward. Would you say that minus one? is a permanent impasse? No, no I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't because uh, then I would, as someone from a diplomatic stream, uh, I would be admitting that something is not possible, that diplomacy has limits and I cannot uh, ever accept that. You know, uh, the Soviet Union was forever until it was no more, you know, so. Uh, so, so, uh, no, my, look, my, I, I would certainly hope one day that even the minus one comes around. Uh, because, you know, you put Kashmir aside for a moment, uh, and, and I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, you, you know, uh, today, if, you, if with everybody else, trade is on the increase, uh, you know, contacts are on the increase, uh, business is on the increase, connectivity is on the increase. I mean, surely at some stage, that would have an impact. Because uh, you would see everybody else prospering with that, with that uh, uh, cooperation and uh, contacts. So I, I always remain hopeful. I'm, I'm not uh, uh, un, you know, unrealistic there. I, I know that we have big, big challenges, uh, that they have a mindset issue out there that they have to overcome. 
but going back to your uh, question on Kashmir, look, uh, I, I think uh, what I, I spoke fairly extensively uh, when I was in the US, and in many cases, you know, when I made points to people, giving them the background, the history, what happened, why we did what we did, uh, a lot of it was new to them, you know. Uh, I, uh, for example, you, because mostly they read their own press, uh, you know, hardly anybody actually had a realization that this was a temporary, uh, temporary article of the Constitution, or the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of the misalignment due to the fact that a lot of our national laws did not apply in the uh, Jammu and Kashmir state. So these were all new things to them because uh, the press normally, what it does is it gives you a very black and white picture. Uh, on many issues, it gives you a picture which corresponds to preconceptions which people have. You know, the press is not uh, without, you know, it, it likes to shape the narrative in some ways. So uh, I think it was useful to talk about it in a very open manner and uh, uh, give people what was our perspective. I think many cases, people more, you know, I, I saw people absorbing that uh, and hopefully they, they agreed with it. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just um, looking at the uh, world in, in more like a macro uh, mm -hmm. perspective, uh, we have gone uh, to be a bit simplistic from a uh, situation with Cold War to maybe uh, some people would say hot peace. There is a lot of uh, uh, conflicts uh, around uh, the world. Uh, we also at the same time have a true multipolar world. At least it's, it's starting mm -hmm. to become so. Some people would say we have a G2, but uh, I, I think there uh, is also uh, many arguments that there are uh, a lot of players uh, now. Um, there is also uh, less um, momentum around the multilateral uh, processes. Uh, WTO uh, is, is facing uh, real uh, challenges and uh, as a Bretton Woods uh, institution. Is the, in this multipolar, multi-conceptual world, uh, India is um, uh, the largest democracy in mm -hmm. the world, 1.2 billion uh, people, Aspiration is 5 trillion economy by 24, maybe 10 trillion economy by 2030. So India's influence is growing. Mm -hmm. w will that also lead to uh, India uh, taking, um, uh, we will see a bigger footprint also from India on foreign and uh, security uh, policy uh, in uh, the region? Uh, in the 70s, uh, and the 80s, India was in many ways the leader of the non-allied um, world. Uh, today, uh, it is a new reality, and where will uh, India place itself, and what, what uh, kind of political initiatives will we see from India in this multipolar world? Uh, okay, there are a lot of questions uh, in there. So let me, let me make a few sharp points as a collective answer. One, no question the world is more nationalistic uh, than in the past. Uh, and a lot of that nationalism is economic nationalism and cultural nationalism. Uh, second, uh, I would say uh, where India is concerned, uh, we in a way are a standout. We are an exception. We are an exception because in this country you could say, yes, we are more nationalistic. But at the same time, we don't see a tension between being nationalistic and being international in the sense of dealing more with the world and engaging more with the world. So the nationalism is not a kind of a negative sentiment directed at the world. In fact, uh, people generally feel if you're going up, you should be doing more things with the world, not less things with the world. Uh, third, in a, in a more multipolar, your word, uh, nationalistic, my word, world, I think we need, we will see diplomacy take different forms uh, where the old ways of working will now not go away, but be tempered by uh, much more, uh, uh, I would say, creative, innovative, ad hoc kind of working arrangements, often centering around issues 
rather than across the board. So, so the character of international politics will probably change in many ways. Uh, four, you have a, I agree with you. I, I think a lot of multilateral regimes will, will uh, come under stress. How they survive will depend on how, how they respond to that. Uh, they will come under stress partly because of this nationalism that I speak to, spoke about. To some extent, a lot of them are also being critiqued for how well they work or don't work. So there's a kind of performance audit on multilateral regimes also going on. Sometimes that can take very unfair directions because if you do a performance audit with a very na self-centered nationalistic view, then, then I'm not sure I'd agree with the conclusions of that audit. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, that, too, uh, that too is a factor. So uh, all in all, I would say a more, uh, a more complicated world, uh, uh, definitely a more interesting one, possibly a more difficult one. Uh, but where India is concerned, uh, you know, um, we, uh, you also made a reference to G2. Uh, we, you know, that's something we, we have never uh, accepted, we've never been comfortable with. Uh, I, I, I think partly what would uh, also distinguish us uh, from from other countries is uh, that we we still have a very strong relationship with countries of the south uh, and uh, we in many negotiations which we would have seen as trade minister as well uh, we not only stand for our own interest to large extent we voice collective uh, interests of the developing world g77 uh, for example, certainly when it comes to trade or when it comes to climate change. So I think that's also a constituency for us. Now, when you look at all of this, you could on the one hand say, okay, it's all getting more difficult, probably true. But you could also say that we are in a very unique position, that today being a market economy, a democracy, socially pluralistic, we have comfort with the West. Being Asian, part of the rise of Asia, we have compared with a lot of this rebalancing and Asian countries. Having a G77 constituency working with countries of Africa uh, and Asia, we, we, uh, uh, we have a much stronger bonding with those countries. So I think we, are, we could be at the right intersection. A lot of it uh, therefore requires active diplomacy to make sure that those constituencies are all uh, sort of brought together. Uh, that's very much the intention of the government. So, uh, uh, so what you have seen really definitely over the last five years, and uh, you saw recently at the UN, is uh, a willingness today to go out, engage countries, visit more countries, uh, and, and therefore you can see a new energy in foreign affairs. No, we, we have seen your very busy agenda. Follow me on, on, on Twitter. Uh, you can be exhausted just... Uh, by reading your Twitter account. Uh, so, uh, but, um, uh, and also your point about uh, Asia, uh, this is the first year, at least since 1850, that Asia is 50% of the global uh, GDP. I think uh, one thing is certain, that uh, India's uh, uh, influence and, and uh, size in the global economy uh, is just gonna increase. Uh, in the years uh, to come. Um, when will we uh, see uh, Belt and Road kind of initiatives uh, from India's side? Or is that not your cup of tea? Will you join the Belt and Road initiative or will you, uh, will you not? Third question in the same um, area. You know, superpowers um, uh, like, uh, Traditionally, but also like today, I would say China is the second largest economy, the US is the largest economy. Also, uh, have this view of uh, that uh, they um, follow uh, very closely what is happening in their backyard. Uh, of course, there is no Monroe Doctrine anymore, but this mm -hmm. notion of Monroe Doctrines uh, is still uh, there. Mm -hmm. Uh, would um, would would India accept uh, whatever happened in your own uh, backyard uh, when it comes to uh, military establishment and etc. Or um, 
that would also be quite interesting too, if you could elaborate on that. Uh, okay. Let me work backwards on your set of questions. I'm glad you're starting with the last one. Uh, no, look, the world's a competitive place, okay? So all of us might have preferences, but, you know, world doesn't run by entitlements. World runs by, by capabilities, by influence, by interest. So I would hope very much that uh, we, we have the ability to influence and compete, which will secure our interests. Now, we are fairly clear what our interests are. You, you put it very diplomatically. I congratulate you. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, uh, I will certainly... I'm, I'm looking at the uh, ambassador from Maldives just here in front of uh, me. So we I will, wanted to be a bit careful. Uh, we, we will certainly make sure that our ability to compete, our ability to uh, secure and advance our interests, our ability to influence other countries, which is all, by the way, this is what international relations is about. Uh, so I would certainly hope that that remains sharp, that remains effective. And uh, in, all the, in this exercise, normally, if there is an epicenter, which is yourself, then how good you are is a function of distance. So you start with your immediate neighborhood. If you can't influence your immediate neighborhood, it is very unlikely you'll be able to influence beyond. So to me, that's like the first circle of your interests. Uh, regarding your Belt and Road issue, you know, we have a long-standing position on that. For us, it, it is connected with sovereignty matters, so that, that hasn't changed. Uh, but your, the, the idea of do we do something similar, look, we are us, we are not some other country. And, and uh, I, I think it's not just on this initiative, I think in a whole lot of other areas. My own sense is, as uh, India becomes bigger, uh, the fact is we will find that concepts uh, and uh, analytics which are developed for other countries would not necessarily apply to us. Uh, and the expectation that we would copy models which are very different in nature, uh, I, do, I don't think uh, that's uh, very likely. Uh, because uh, typically, I mean, we, we do a lot of things even in our own neighborhood, you know, some of which may surprise you, the scale of which. But, it's not, you know, uh, the, this is in a, in a way, uh, you, you do these things. I mean, it's done even, even within India, if you look at it. Uh, it's the, the manner of which it's done is much more disaggregated. It's much more organic. Uh, on connectivity, for example, rather than say we have a grand initiative, we would much rather say, okay, we have a development partnership. In fact, that's exactly what my prime minister said when he went to Africa last year, where he said, look, we are prepared to do very much more in Africa, but we would like to know what you want, and we'd like to know your priority, and we'd like you to take part in it, and we'd like you to actually own and operate it once we have set it up. So I think that's very much more our manner of, of doing things. So uh, it may not make that splash, but I think in many ways, I mean, if you go to some countries, for example, you go to Afghanistan, uh, uh, it's, it's not a story which always comes in the headlines, but I would t really say with a degree of confidence that probably more Afghans know about what India has done in terms of development than most other countries. So uh, a softer form of diplomacy yes, yes. from the largest yes, democracy. I would say a softer, more collaborative, more co-owned, uh, you know, uh, Look in the, I mean, this is us, okay? I mean, other countries can legitimately differ. I would say if you're doing something, uh, I would much rather be that that sense of partnership comes out rather than other people think that it's all mine. It's more likely to stay, it's more likely to give me the kind of returns uh, that I really want. We also know from uh, history that uh, superpowers will uh, be challenged to also uh, try to uh, deal with conflicts in the region. Would mm -hmm. we also see uh, India, for example, um, volunteering to um, also uh, try to be a mediator in, in some of uh, the conflicts in the region? Could we, for example, see... Um, this is a very Norwegian question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Nor Norway is not, has never been a superpower. I, no, I but that has not stopped you mediating. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I used to say when I was foreign minister, the only organization in the world where Norway is a superpower is EFTA. And EFTA is this free trade organization with Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Iceland. So, uh, and we try to establish a trade deal with India. Uh, but um, on, on this, for example, we know the situation for Rohingyas uh, between Myanmar and Bangladesh. Could that be something uh, where India uh, could be a mediator? Maybe an even a bigger uh, question that I think we all uh, are concerned about is the situation in the Gulf and uh, with Iran uh, that has been escalating, has been a little bit more quiet uh, the last um, week because there are other things uh, in the media, but I don't think the structural challenges related to this uh, is uh, dealt with. Or is it a very Norwegian uh, perspective? No, look, uh, I mean, if I look back on our history, uh, there are times when we've done some of that, we uh, we took a little bit of interest in the Iran-Iraq war in the early stages. Uh, we did a not successful mediation in Sri Lanka. Uh, not not uh, as bad as the Norwegian store, I uh, think. No, actually ours ended up worse. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, you know, uh, there's been, it's not entirely without uh, some past. But uh, I, I think the Indian way would be very much more that if you have relationships to sort of uh, talk about it, to have conversations, but not, not uh, declare yourself a mediator and not really kind of create that space and, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, create that profile. I, I don't think uh, that's really been our style. I don't, uh, I mean, I, I, I would say, uh, personally, I'm, I'm not sure for a country like us, I, I mean, I'm not uh, prescribing for everybody else, uh, but uh, I, I would, uh, uh, it's, it's not something which I see great profit in. But having said that, you know, some of the examples that you raised, say, you raised Myanmar, Bangladesh, now we have excellent relations with both. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have uh, made, uh, I mean, we are, we are the first country to actually complete a, uh, uh, project in the Rakhine state uh, after the, uh, you know, the problems. Uh, we've, we've done a housing project and we are hoping that that would be the nucleus for the first set of people to go back. Uh, so, so we have relations there. We are, our relations with uh, Bangladesh, of course, are absolutely outstanding, the best ever. Uh, so it's not that we don't, you know, we are staying away or we are, but I think we just handle it much differently from the manner in which you put it. And I think the, the bigger a country is, the more um, power uh, you also have in inspiring um, uh, uh, countries. And, and you are, I think, the largest FDI investor in Bangladesh and the second mm -hmm. one uh, in Myanmar. I think the Chinese are uh, larger there uh, by far uh, than you. But uh, coming back um, also uh, to what you mentioned about connectivity and... Uh, also technology. Uh, when you were in uh, DC, I don't know if you felt it the same way. I was uh, there last week and behind this uh, trade war um, uh, notion, there is also a lot about technologies. Mm -hmm. Who's gonna be on top of uh, the new technologies? And I think there is a Sputnik moments in many uh, countries these days and many countries uh, do see that those countries that are on top of the new technologies and in the platform economy the winner has a tendency to take it uh, all will also come out of this entry as the most uh, influential um, ones. Uh, last year at this time uh, I, I was here and Prime Minister Modi opened the World Economic Forum's uh, Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution in India that is placed in Mumbai. Uh, but uh, on the technology side, how um, do you see uh, technologies uh, also uh, know as an important factor uh, in foreign uh, policy? And you see that as an underlying um, factor uh, more and more. Well, 
look, uh, if you look at the global global scene, uh, yes, you you know the the term Sputnik moment is used. But by the way, bear in mind the Sputnik moment was for the non-Sputnik country. Yeah. You know, it was the U.S. actually reacting to the Sputnik uh, in a way. The, the country which sent up the Sputnik didn't fare so well uh, after that. Uh, so clearly, I mean, today the uh, political competition or strategic competition is also expressing itself uh, very much as a, uh, as a uh, technology competition, uh, if you would. Uh, so when there is, I mean, first of all, as I said, competition is natural. Uh, so uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the idea, of course, is while it is natural, it is not unconstrained that, that somewhere the, the net result of that is, is positive. Uh, if it gives people more choices, it's, it's actually all for the good. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it's a little bit like politics. I mean, we would prefer a multipolar world because it gives you more choices. Uh, so if you have a multipolar technological world, that too gives you more choices. But on the uh, issue of what, where we are, I mean, it's very clear that we have to go down that direction. And if you look, I mean, uh, we are one of those countries where really are, I mean, for every country, its assets are its people. But many countries have other assets too, as you know in Norway. Uh, but we are really completely HR dependent. Uh, you know, our future is completely HR dependent. So a lot of it, to my mind, would be to prepare yourself for a future by improving the quality of your HR and getting your people prepared for a different world. And that can start right down to the basics. I mean, it starts from really from primary health and literacy uh, and uh, up to, you know, education, to skilling, to digitizing, uh, to employing. I mean, you know, all of that is part of really improving uh, the quality uh, of our HR. And to my mind, uh, that is one area where we had lagged behind, uh, and uh, uh, I, I would certainly see that as a as really the core priority of this government. I mean, if you look at the totality of all the programs they do, there's a single thread that connects them, and the single thread is really to to really improve the quality of human resources of this country. Well, and uh, it's so. Um I, I agree so much. I think this upskilling, reskilling, building the human capital uh, in in the country is so crucial. I, I, I think uh, on behalf of all uh, the participants, I, I think we all feel that India is very privileged uh, to have um, such an insightful um, uh, foreign minister. Uh, at, at the end, because we're not going to clear the ground for, uh, for the next session, but just to... I think you partly answered it at the end uh, now about building on the human capital, but you know, you're one, I think you were the second uh, minister coming from the foreign service. So you have a vast experience uh, on foreign policy and security policy um, as a former permanent secretary and, and civil servant and ambassador for many years. If you then look um, uh, at what kind of footprint you would like uh, to leave uh, in uh, the ministry and, and India's foreign policy. Well, if you could just in in a minute or, or two share with us uh, that at the end, it would be, uh, we would appreciate well, it. Well, look, I've just come in. I mean, you're asking me what would it be when I leave. I, I think you need to give me a few years to think that through. Yeah, I think uh, you have but, made uh, some reflections. Uh, but, uh, uh, no, but seriously, I would, look, I, I would certainly uh, like to see uh, Indian foreign policy have a bigger footprint uh, uh, to to see it much more uh, influential uh, in determining the outcomes of global issues. Uh, to obviously see our interests and influence secured uh, in you know our immediate periphery and beyond. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm very conscious that this is we are preparing a foreign policy for a country which. I mean, within a decade would be the third largest economy, which would be the most populous country, and which carries a lot of burdens of the past in the sense that, you know, we missed a lot of opportunities in the past, beginning with 1945 when the global order was fashioned. So how do you make up for all the things which you lost out on and yet prepare for all the things that await you? 
So it will require a lot of thinking through, a lot of imagination, and a lot of energy. And I try to at least prepare a launching pad for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.